very much for inviting me to this. So I'll talk today about the asteroid impact deflection assessment, which is a combination of a NASA mission and an ESA mission. <clears throat> and essentially, it's about the danger that we know of asteroids colliding with the Earth. And a little bit the message is that we are now in a, in a special time that we are now the first generation who would be who might be available who might be able to avoid such a collision should we be able to predict it. So this is a little bit the structure of the talk. I'll talk first about the asteroid impact risk, then about different methods, what man can think of to avoid it, and finally <clears throat> about the AIDA collaboration of uh, NASA and ESA. So something which is relatively well known is that we now think that the dinos dinosaurs became extinct because a roughly 10 kilometer sized asteroid hit the Earth in what's nowadays the Gulf of Mexico. And <clears throat> of course, it, uh, and of course, the dinosaurs were not killed by the most of them were not killed by the direct hit, but with the climatic changes that came from with the impact, especially with the dust that was ejected in the atmosphere at the time. Now, studies of the past of the Earth um, give at least the idea this, that this has happened on more occasions. So this plot shows for, for in time ranges of a few million years, the percentage of the existing species that became extinct. And some of those changes also define um, boundaries in the, in, in the geohistorically record of the Earth. <clears throat> and most of the cases are not as clear as the one, as the KPG one, the one where the dinosaurs became extinct. But we think that the five ones that are marked here those five mass extinctions have also been caused by asteroid impact or by maybe comet impact, as we don't know in this, those cases. Um, so this shows that those catastrophes, catastrophes happen and that they, they have a major impact of the evolution of, the, of life on Earth. Now, one can see from this graph, this is something which is statistically distributed and happens roughly something like every 100 million years. So it happening in the near future is, is very unlikely from that point of view. However, there are also smaller impacts and the smaller they are, the more frequent are they simply because they are more small asteroids than large asteroids. And of course, also smaller ones can make considerable damage. Another example I have here is Meteor Crater in Arizona. It's thought to be a, a metallic object that has hit the crater is 1.2 kilometers in diameter, and the age is estimated to be about 50,000 years. And it's clear that such an impact would also be devastating if it hits in a, in a populated area. Getting more recent, the Tunguska event <clears throat> that happened a bit more than 100 years ago in Siberia. It was a smaller object, an object that we now think was maybe 40 or 50 meters in sight. It exploded above the Tunguska, and a large, a large forest area was destroyed as a, as a photo taken somewhat after the, uh, somewhat later, as showing here. So this are uh, uh, obviously the dinosaurio killers outside our experience, but um, smaller, but still notable or even dangerous events are happening anytime or happen much more frequently. A really more recent event, oops, a really more recent event is the uh, Shelyabinsk impact, as uh, a Shelyabinsk explosion that you may have heard of. <coughs> That happened in 2013 in the above the city of Chelyabinsk in Russia. Uh, on the left side is a video taken by a, by a car camera 
which of course is, is there for, for insurance purposes, not to avoid, not, not to, to watch asteroids, but it has shown the, uh, the explosion close to the city of Chelyabinsk and mostly due to breaking glass, uh, 1,500 or 2,000 people have been injured by this impact. And just for the, the, the curiosity of it, next, next to it is a meteorite that found, was found near Chelyabinsk with the cube on the left side of the meteorite being one centimeter. So some small fragments of the asteroid that exploded, uh, that exploded, they have been recovered from ground. Now, trying to evaluate <clears throat> what the danger really is, <clears throat> this is a plot essentially of what we now know about the number of asteroids, uh, of, of near-Earth asteroids versus their brightness or their size, which is more or less equivalent. And then also the number of asteroids, which is the left-hand side, can be translated into a statistical impact interval. And starting with the Chicxulub impact, the Dinosauria killer, we get indeed the scale on the, the lower right of the plot that it happens roughly once every 100 million years. A meteor crater, we would be at one kilometer size and it would be about once every million years. Um, now, according to this, the Tungusk, uh, Tunguska event happens every few hundred years, and the Chelyabay events every few, Chelyabinsk events, sorry, every few decades. Now, <coughs> typically, impacts where we would want to do something about in terms of deflection are at an impact of size of about 100 meters or so, and this is something which happens roughly once every few thousand, every 10,000 years. So it's nothing to, to, to panic about, but of course it's something that can, and that, that, that can happen at any time with a, with a relatively low probability. Now that we know that the risk exists, the next question is then of course, what can we do about it? So, of course, the first thing to avoid an impact of an asteroid is to know that it will happen. And for that, we have to, de to, de we have to detect the objects. And for that, we have search programs, like, for example, the Panstars telescopes in Hawaii, which are shown on this photo here. And what you essentially do with those is, oops. What you essentially do with those is you try to you try to detect the asteroids because they are moving along the sky, sky relative to the stars. It's also done at ESA with the optical ground station in Tenerife, <clears throat> and also time. Some time is used for this. It's a very uh, some very limited amount of time. It's a very large telescope in, in Chile, the four eight meter telescopes. And if you look at this, um, if you look at this in, uh, image, uh, you may be able to see some of the asteroids um, that are moving that, that are moving there. So the first, the, the, the two on the tops on the top you probably spotted. They are quite bright. They are quite obvious. The next one is already a bit more difficult to see. It's less bright and also it moves it moves slower in its angular motion uh, uh, on the sky. And there's a fourth one where I would say you won't be able to see without really analyzing the image with just with looking at the sequence of images that we see here. It's very faint and it's at this point. I, I'm not, honestly, I'm not even sure if it will be visible on the, uh, if it's projected on the screen, but you see uh, there's, this, there's a faint object moving also from the lower left to the, to the upper right where the arrow appeared just now.
Um, and actually, if you are interested, um, you can discover or follow Asterwitz also from home. There is a what's called citizen science project where you can find asteroids in the in images from the Hubble Space Telescope. So periodically new images are released for the public who is given some instructions and can, can search for asteroids. So the colored picture here is a sequence of Hubble Space Telescope um, images. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, a, it's a sequence of Hubble Space Telescope images where you where, where the, and where the strange curves, the strange curves are the asteroid orbits. And what's curved there is not the, the orbit of the asteroid, but the orbit of the space telescope around Earth. And this makes it very convenient with Hubble that the strange lines allows one also to identify the asteroids. Um, actual images look more like what you see on the right hand side and somebody who is interested can contribute to the search for asteroids and also to following to known asteroids with this, uh, with this project. Now, this is a bit an overview of, uh, of the result of those detection programs. Um, so nowadays we know uh, about 22,000 near Earth asteroids, so asteroids in near Earth space. They, we can see that nearly all of them were detected in the last 20 years. <clears throat> and they are sorted here according to the size. So the, the red ones at the bottom are those that are a kilometer or bigger in size. And you can see that the, the, the number of uh, the number we know hasn't much changed in the last years. So there haven't really been new detections, which mean which means that we know most of them. Um, the yellow ones are those that are roughly 140 meters or, or larger. There one can see that they are still detected now at a more or less constant pace over the last years. And we think that with those, we are complete currently to, to 30% or so. And it's a goal within the next roughly 10 years to know also 90% of those objects. And then if you take all asteroids nowadays during close Earth blabber, very small ones of a few meters are found. These are by now most of the asteroids we know, but it's actually only a small fraction of those uh, those that exist, but the let's say the most dangerous one are those in the in the yellow and red region here, roughly. So okay, now that we know the that, that we know which asteroids exist exist near us and we can compute their orbits. Then the next question is, if we see that one of them will hit, what can we do about this? So which is called asteroid deflection. And so the scheme is, 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 is a, the concept is quite simple. One has to move the asteroid away so that the asteroid, instead of hitting the Earth, Earth passes it and doesn't, and doesn't collide. They are pretty much, let's say, on, on uh, of methods that one would consider to be feasible in the near future. There are three major methods. One is called the gravity tractor. The idea is hovering with the spacecraft next to the asteroid, and then the mass of the spacecraft will attract the asteroid and will therefore change its orbit and integrate it over a long period. It moves the orbit then by, let's say, one Earth radius and would, will make it enough, instead of hitting the Earth, it will miss the Earth. It's a very simple, conceptually very simple. It also depend, doesn't really depend on any quantity except for the masses of the asteroid and the spacecraft and the distance before the two. It's just the law of, the, uh, of gravitation. So in this sense, it's conceptually simple. The problem is, that in practice, 
the mass of the spacecraft will always be very small compared to the mass of the asteroid. So even with close hovering, the method is rather, rather inefficient and to be and to be possible for the for deflection, it would require both a relatively small asteroid and a very long warning time of decades. Otherwise, this message the method would be too small, too slow. So. On the other end of the scale is a, is a nuclear explosion. <clears throat> now the idea here is not, not really to nuke the asteroid, but more again to place a spacecraft uh, next to the asteroid at a, at a certain distance to the asteroid, have the nuclear projectile explode there, and then the pressure wave could push the asteroid away. So it's not really uh, uh, completely blasting it, but still it's less controlled than other, other methods in the sense that it's a bit difficult to dose the push. And it's hard to say if one would maybe de uh, destroy the asteroid, where it's then not controlled in which direction the fragments go. And of course, there are, are the elliptic, the, 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 is the uh, additional risk of having to launch such devices from Earth. And also for this method, I think a demonstration mission would be would be more difficult to justify. So the method, the current message of choice, at least for first um, for first demonstration, is a kinetic impactor, which is also a simple concept. You have a you have a you have a spacecraft that just hits the asteroid and pushes it away. So without any being any bomb, it's just the momentum from the spacecraft that will be transferred to the asteroid and change the direction the asteroid is, is, is moving. So the efficiency is intermediate between, between the two. It can be used with somewhat lower warning time and somewhat bigger asteroids than the, than the nuclear method. Uh, one complication is that the effect of a kinetic impact depends on the properties of, asteroid, of the asteroid. Um, and why this is the case, I'm trying to explain in the sketch. So essentially the physics behind is that the momentum of the impactor is transferred from the motor to, uh, to, to the asteroid and therefore for changes the velocity of the asteroid. So if it if the if the spacecraft and the asteroid were billiard balls, it would be very simple. The spacecraft which is mass and its velocity hits the asteroid. And then the velocity change of the asteroid would be the velocity of the spacecraft multiplied by the ratio <coughs> between the two masses. But the complication of this is when the uh, when the spacecraft hits, it will create a crater, and ejecta will will come out of the of the crater, which is actually good because the ejecta come out preferentially in the direction of the spacecraft, and the and then the reaction force of those. Uh, um, of those ejecta creates an additional momentum on the asteroid. So the momentum of the impact is enhanced by the, by the ejecta, by the reaction force of the ejecta. Um, this is given here, so we can add to the, uh, to the momentum of the, <clears throat> of the asteroid after the impact, in addition to the momentum of the spacecraft, the momentum that comes, the momentum of the ejector essentially. Now it turns out if we want to, to do this in a controlled fashion, what the momentum of the ejector is, or what the, uh, or, or, or what the, uh, yeah, the, the, the ejector mass especially depends to a large extent on the asteroid, on the, on the properties of the asteroid. So here in this case, what I'm showing is the momentum transfer enhancement factor, which is uh, better, which is defined in a way, if it is one, 
then there are no ejecta. The complete the momentum transfer is only the direct impact of the spacecraft. And there's no enhancement through ejecta. If it is true, it would mean that the contribution from the ejecta, the from enhancement of the ejecta, is the same as the uh, is the same as the direct impact. So as we can see in this plot, for very solid targets with water targets of very low porosity, the secondary, the the the, the, the uh, principally the secondary effect of the ejector can even be larger than the direct impact effect. While for high porous bodies, and we know that some of the small uh, bodies in the solar system are of very high porosity, the effect is nearly negligible <coughs> with, with uh, even less than 10% of enhancement. Similarly, the the strength of the of the asteroid or the material where the spacecraft would hit into plays a, plays a significant role. So this plot shows the <coughs> size of the crater versus the size of the impact. So in this case, the size of the, the size of the spacecraft for for various materials. So the the, the black curve is from impact experiments into water, so gravity only happening no uh, no strengths and the others the blue and the green curves are for for different strengths of the uh, for different strengths of the material the red curve is a is a, is a, is a, is a bit complex strengths model I just go to the strengths which are given here in Pascal so between <coughs> 100 kilopascal and 100 megapascal and one can see that the crater diameter, decreases strongly at a given impact diameter if we increase the strengths. And of course, with a smaller crater, there are less ejecta. And again, there will be much uh, lower ejecta, uh, ejecta momentum if the strength is, is much larger. So the consequence of this is that for such a kinetic impactor, to understand what's happening, one also needs uh, will need a second spacecraft that that looks at the, at the crater, but also investigates the asteroids to see where one is in those parameters and to be able also to scale the impact to the real case. Now this is a bit an overview um, where we about the methods what we would do against an asteroid. So for everything that's smaller than, than 100 meters or so, uh, yeah, it says civil defense, which essentially means, means running away or hiding in the basement. Um, <clears throat> then the gravity tractor, as mentioned, is, could be the method of choice if the asteroid is not more than a 100, 200, or a few hundred meters, and the, the warning time is several decades. Kinetic impactor can be used pretty much for all the asteroids that are smaller than 500 meters or so and have a couple of years warning time. With a longer warning time, it can also be considered for larger objects. And if it's a really big object like the dinosaur killer that comes in, only the nuclear choice so the, the, would be the, the nuclear choice would be the only possibility. Now, keeping in mind that there are many more small asteroids and large asteroids, most likely <coughs> the method of choice for the first real case would be the kinetic impactor again, because the real case we say we start at roughly 100 meters. So the, the, and given the size distribution, the first real case is, is most likely something with 100, 200, maybe 300 meters in size. So now a collaboration has started to test exactly this kinetic impact or method to, to avoid an asteroid impact. It's called AIDA and stands for Asteroid Impact Deflection Assessment. And it consists of two missions, NASA's START mission, 
is going to be launched next year and will hit the moon of the binary asteroid Didymos in 2022. So what has been decided to do, to do kind of a technology demonstration on a smaller scale with the, uh, so changing the orbit of the moon around the, the primary asteroid, which is, can be done with less effort. So with a lower mass spacecraft, then one would need to demonstrably change the heliocentric orbit of, the, of an asteroid. And it solves the additional problem that, which is in a sense more a, com, uh, a problem of public communication. If you change the heliocentric object of an asteroid for demonstration, it's very difficult to, to demonstrate that this will not create an impact in the far future if you, because you can calculate trajectories only, only up to a certain point. Um, so, okay, that is going to impact the asteroid in 2022. It will change if the mission is successful, the orbital period of the, uh, of the moon, which is by, by a couple of minutes. The period is 12 hours. The period change itself will be observable from Earth because the asteroid itself is an eclipsing binary. And from the times when the primary eclipse is a secondary or vice versa, or, or the, also the time of the occultations, one can accurately determine the, determine the, the <clears throat> orbital period of the secondary around the primary and also of the change of it. And the impact in 2022 takes advantage of a relatively close approach of Didymos to Earth where relatively close means 10 million kilometers or so, where it is easily to, easy to observe from astronomical observatories. <coughs> then several years later, HERA will come in. HERA is a European mission. And we will launch it in 2024 from, from Kourou, and it will arrive at the double asteroid in 2027. And go into orbit of it to investigate the asteroid and the consequences of the impact. Uh, you can also see in the sketch the two, two small CubeSats that HERA is going to, to take to the asteroids. I'll, I'll talk a bit more about them in a minute. So this is a sketch of the, of the system. <coughs> the asteroid Didymos is roughly 800 meters in diameter, and its moon is 160 or 170 meters in size and a bit more than a kilometer away, so it's a rather close pair of asteroids. We don't know for sure, but most likely the moon is a piece of the primary that was formed at the time when the primary was rotating very quickly and some material was injected from it and reaccumulated into the moon. And actually, at its last close approach in 2003, the asteroid was observed with radar. So we have first, even the first uh, kind of radar image of it. It's not really an image; it's a shape model that is based on the on the data we got from radar. We have some rough idea on on how the object looks like. So this is a bit more uh, on the HERA mission. That will, <coughs> that will impact in 2022. Um, HERA will, afterwards in 24, HERA will be launched. We'll probably fly by in another asteroid on its way to, on its way to Didymos, the, but the flyby target has not yet been chosen will arrive in Didymos in early 27. And the way we are going to operate the spacecraft is pretty much similar to, to what was done for Rosetta at Comet Churyumov-Gerasimenko. 
So when we'll start as a first investigation orbit at 20, 30 kilometers roughly from the two asteroids to get the shape, to get the, to get the gravity, to get the, mostly to get the information that is needed uh, to get closer. And then the detailed characterization of the asteroids will be at distances of 10, 15 kilometers, um, essentially to get, the, to get a bit the geophysical properties, to start looking at the crater that was created from that. And then at some point in this phase, the two CubeSats will be released. Those are two mini satellites of 30 times 20 times 10 centimeters that will have their own payload. It would be the first CubeSats that would really independently navigate in interplanetary space and do scientific measurements. Um, so then also the main spacecraft would take close flybys to get closer to the objects <clears throat> and mostly focus then of the detailed investigation of the dark crater to understand the impact, to understand the properties of the asteroid, especially in the crater region. Also the information that are needed to really, to really transfer the, the result of the demonstration to, to, to another case. And something important is to be able to calculate the efficiency that I talked about before, we need to know the mass of the secondary, the mass of the moon. The mass of the primary is more or less known already now due to the orbit of the moon, but the mass of the moon can only be determined by a spacecraft rendezvous, which will take advantage of the wobble of the primary by the, by the motion of the secondary. So similar as the center of mass of the Earth's moon system is not in the center of the Earth, but somebody, somebody offset. And this causes a wobble in the Earth motion of the Earth, I've seen from outside, due to the moon has a similar effect here. The size of the effect is expected to be order of 10 meters. So, so it should be, well, easy. It should be possible to detect it with the spacecraft. After that, <coughs> Um, after that, the, the plan for all the spacecraft is to land uh, for the CubeSats probably on the on the moon, for the main HERA spacecraft main, um, perhaps to, to land actually on the primary at the end of mission. Of course, there will be nobody to observe the landing of the of the main spacecraft at the end, so the main idea would be taking taking measurements from very close before touchdown. So uh, a, a quick overview of the, the payload we are going to carry. So of course there are, there are cameras on the, on the main spacecraft, which are actually the flight spare units from the <clears throat> cameras that have flown with NASA's uh, dawn mission to, to, the, to Vera, the Vesta and Ceres, two of the biggest asteroids in the main belt. We are taking essentially the same cameras. There will be a thermal infrared instrument to measure the, the temperature and the surface properties and also be to contribute to the composition through uh, to measurements in different filters in the thermal infrared. Um, we will carry a laser that measures the, the highly accurate the distance and therefore supports the, the cameras in getting the shape of the asteroid and also to interpret a little bit the, the, the geology of the asteroid. And finally, we have the two uh, CubeSats. One is, is, is called Juventus. And as a prime instrument, it carries a radar that is supposed to measure the interior structure of the, the, the asteroid. Uh, essentially, it's a monostatic radar, so essentially the um, the, 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 the properties of the reflected signal from the subsurface provide the, some information about the, the porosity and the making of the, of the subsurface of the asteroid. And it has some accelerometers which are mainly useful to get the surface properties, surface strengths, especially 
at landing. <clears throat> the second cube that has a fabry perot imaging spectrometer in the visible near infrared, which is mainly for the taxonomy and the composition of the asteroid. There's currently a design change to the second instrument. And the basic reason is, I should have maybe mentioned that the HERA mission is not in either science program, but is a, as a planetary defense mission is in what's called space safety and security. And other than in science, which has a fixed budget, the missions in the optional program where the space safety program belongs to are funded depending to contributions of individual member states. Now, the mission was approved last November on the ministerial conference. Mm, and the distribution of money from the member states was somewhat uh, different from what it had been in the in the studies before, which means that the system lead on the second cube that and therefore also the second the second instrument are going to change, which is also on this end, and it's by the way also the reason that I call it here second cube that and it doesn't really have a name. This is a little bit of peculiarity on the way. Uh, essentially on the way either as an agency made up of 22 countries is working. So finally, you may know Brian May, the, the guitarist from, from Queen. Let him explain the, the mission to you. Is going to show us things no one's ever seen before. This ESA mission will be humanity's first ever spacecraft to visit a double asteroid, Didymos. This asteroid is typical of the thousands <coughs> that pose an impact risk to our planet. Imagine a mountain in the sky with another rock about the size of the Great Pyramid swinging around it. That's Didymos. And just the seemingly tiny moon would be big enough to destroy a city if it were to collide with the Earth. But we're going to find out if it's possible to deflect it. This is going to be really, really hard. Aiming at a 160 meter wide target across millions of kilometers of void. Could we stop an asteroid hitting planet Earth? The dinosaurs couldn't, but we humans have the benefit of knowledge and science on our side. HERA is led by a multinational team of scientists and engineers humanities makers and doers. Right now, all we have is many years of research and theories, but HERA will revolutionize our understanding of asteroids and how to protect ourselves from them. First, NASA will slam its DART spacecraft into the smaller asteroid at more than six kilometers a second. Then ESA comes in. HERA will map the impact crater left by DART and measure the asteroid's mass. Knowing this mass is key to determining what's inside and knowing for certain whether we would be able to deflect it. Next come our briefcase sized CubeSats. If you think of HERA like an aeroplane, then CubeSats will operate more like drones, able to take more risks flying closer to the asteroid, carrying state-of-the-art science instruments, eventually touching down. The scale of this experiment is huge. One day, these results could be crucial for saving our planet. Hero's up-close observations after DART's impact will help prove whether asteroids can be deflected, <laughs> prove whether this is an effective planetary defense technique so that if an asteroid ever poses a real threat to Earth, we'll be ready. Okay, so as a very short summary, if we detect the asteroids close to the Earth, especially those ones that will hit one day, if we follow their orbits to know which will hit, and if we are now able to demonstrate, if you are now demonstrate that we are able 
to deflect an asteroid with, with AIDA, then I think we can say we are reasonably safe for the future and we are the first generation who can say that. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Michael, Michael, we're collecting the questions during the, your speech. And so, uh, uh, could you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, okay, so I will read you questions and I give you a chance to answer them. Okay, so, sure. uh, well, that's, uh, well, okay, it's, it's from a little bit under kinds. The question is, in your opinion, when will mining at asteroids start? And uh, what will be the first mined material? <laughs> um, honestly, my personal opinion is it will take some time. Um, first of all, if uh, currently, I mean, if we uh, if we see what a uh, what what uh, a sample return mission that just just in quotes brings a few grams of asteroid material or maybe a kilo back to us what it costs we are far from the possibility to mine asteroid material and to bring it back to us essentially to sell it and i think also the asteroid mining companies are going more and more away from this concept and the focus is now more on in space utilization like the idea is water thrusters that you may get from asteroids that contain water that you could get this water from the uh, retrieve the water from the asteroid and use it as in space fuel that doesn't have to be launched from earth and this may then make make sense energetically and also from cost reasons so this is where I could see the future that, uh, and then, but then the materials would not be precious metals. The material that would, um, the material that would be extracted would be water or other materials that could be used as, as propellants. And the reason I'm saying not any time soon is, or let's say several decades at least, is, First of all, the technology, much of the technology for this is still to be developed. And also the market for this needs still to be created in the sense there is not, I mean, we have, of course, the NASA, ESA, YAXA missions, but still there's not that much interplanetary, interplanetary space travel yet. So yes, it is a topic for the future, but I personally at least see it for the, the bit more distant future. So not invest my money now to it. Okay, fine. So uh, <laughs> second, uh, second one, who is conspirator? <laughs> this is someone tried to be funny and, okay, so conspirator, you could, you could give this question by yourself. If not, okay, I will ask another question. Okay, so the question is how it is uh, to work with Brian May and what is the story behind the promotion of main to Hera mission? <laughs> okay, about working with Brian May, I have to admit, I have never met Brian May in person, so I cannot answer that part. Some of the colleagues on the, some of my mission colleagues uh, um, have actually. Um, well, Brian May actually has, stu has studied astrophysics and he has in, had interrupted his PhD in astrophysics well when he became guitarist of May, um, guitarist of Queen, sorry. Um, and then uh, several years ago, he finished his PhD, something about zodiacal dust. And then he became very much interested in the in solar system missions and especially stereo images and creating stereo images from camera images and he did something of of this for Rosetta and he also developed an interest in planetary defense so he strongly supported the Hera mission 
when it was still a candidate mission, when it was on its way to uh, to, to adoption by the, by the ministerial conference. A bit of background is HERA was already proposed three years earlier in the ministerial conference in 2016 and did not succeed. And Brian May was among the persons who has always promoted doing something for planetary defense and about, about going ahead with those kind of projects. And because he's a well-known uh, well person, he then, of course, is very, very helpful in that he, he, he has more impact than others. OK, thank you. Thank you. Uh, another question for you. OK, what is your estimation? How long before impact we will find asteroid which we consider necessary to deflect? So should we have a rocket on the ramp, ramp all the time, or it is? <laughs> um, well, we currently, I would say in most cases, one should be able to detect them a, a few years before. And the <clears throat> idea of the current search programs, which are especially driven by NASA, is that in 10 years or so, we know nearly all of them, except for a few that will be on orbits where there are different to be uh, to be detected. So once we know most of the nearest asteroids in those size, for those, one will know at least several years, probably even decades in advance, is if they if they will hit or if there is a high likelihood that they will hit. For the few others on unlikely orbits, the show warning time could also be also be very short. Okay. And thank you. Okay. <coughs> okay, okay. okay, so uh, I, I will uh, read one more question and I give to word to Guy, which is uh, waiting also for give, to giving questions. So, uh, Tunguska meteorite has diameter of 65 meters. Chelyabins has 20 meters. So, should we have to deflect such relatively small asteroids? Because they are smaller than Didymos. Yes, currently it would be difficult. Currently <clears throat> it would simply be difficult, firstly, because it's difficult to detect them. We don't know most of the asteroids of those size. And secondly, because they are so small, they are also difficult to hit. Okay, so please. So I have one question. If it's possible to destroy uh, meteorites, uh, especially a um, few seconds before the impact. Like we have, we have now technology with rocket or something like this. I don't know. So <laughs> that I, I will try to say it uh, aloud that if we are able to, could, sorry, could you hear us? I think the question was if we could hit an asteroid that's coming in a few seconds before it hits. Yes, but from Earth, yes. I mean that we have rocket on the Earth and by by the rocket, uh, rocket uh, from just like we have intercontinental missile and we just shot it a ah, few seconds before it starts to the asteroids. Okay. Never thought about that. Yeah, because I, I tried to add the intercontinental missile could reach like 9,000 kilometers, okay? Then this fall down, okay? So it's, well, maybe a few seconds. You have a few seconds. I don't know. If yes, this, so this is what's I your question, know, okay? I don't know if the asteroid would simply be too fast for that. Ah, so no time, okay. Okay, I, I will use uh, uh, another question. How many people currently working at HERA mission? HERA mission? And how it is organized? Do you have uh, regular meetings, uh, collaboration, uh, author list? Do you see something different uh, than in other mission in the organization of the HERA mission? Yeah. Uh, and the first question was how many people are working there, right? Yes, yes, currently now. On currently, the, on the okay. HERA it's currently because it has been accepted a couple of months ago, it's currently ramping up. Um, I think there will soon be, I don't know, a few hundred. I don't know if you take industry, ESA and everything to and instrument teams and everything together. Um, it's a, the difference is it's a relatively small mission. 
in terms of funding, also in terms of spacecraft science. Size. So the big science missions are bigger, in a sense, maybe slower in the development. And we are, we are quicker, leaner, and, and maybe taking also a bit more of, more of risk. And yeah, the organization is, is different. One difference is which I hinted a bit to in the, during the talk. So the, the either science mission, like, well, Rosetta to the Comet, for example, <clears throat> they are in a, in a fixed program with a fixed funding. And essentially, then <clears throat> uh, they, are built, they are built according to a secured budget. For a mission like HERA, one has to uh, essentially get the interest from the member states. And where each member state uh, can uh, contribute then uh, according to their interest in the mission. And interest in the mission in this context is not necessarily interest in asteroid at our asteroid deflection, but in many cases, more interest in contributions that the industry in the respective country could do and ways essentially for the money that they spend on the mission to, to, to flow back into, the, into their country. Thank you. Sorry, may, may I, maybe I missed it. How much is budget, overall budget for HERA? Uh, the overall budget of HERA is around 250 million euro. Awesome. Yeah. So it, the, okay. I, I mean, and if, I mean, if you have oh, budget. Rosetta is more than a billion. I mean, you, you personally, I will ask this question. You personally, if you have budget as, let's say, as James Webb Space Telescope, so 10 billion, which mission would you like to see to fly? Oh, it's 10 billion. <clears throat> yeah, let's say so that you, 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 you will have key to, 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 to most uh, rich. Uh, yeah, I uh, would maybe. In the earth. Yeah, so one thing, one, one thing I could, um, I mean, yeah, just a bigger space telescope is kind of a boring answer. So something I could think about is to return a sample from the, from the subsurface, really a cold sample from the subsurface on a, on a comet and bring it back in cold state to, to Earth. I mean, this is, it's, it's not related to the subject of this talk, but it would really bring back a piece of material uh, of a building block of the solar system, so to speak, in a more or less in the same state as it was when it was formed, when, when the solar system formed billion year, billions of years ago, which would, and the, the, the composition and structure of that would tell us a lot about how the solar system formed, and maybe also, so how the, play, the, the, the small bodies formed, and also how the planets formed out of the building blocks, out of the, the what's, those objects which that were like the, the asteroids and comets nowadays, and also may answer those questions, which of the material that was necessary for life was maybe brought to the Earth by, by comets and asteroids. I, I, I'm, of course, biased, but I could think, I, for, for a big mission, I could think on, of such a mission to bring back a sample from the, from the cold and unprocessed subsurface of a, of a comet. And this is doable for 10 billion, okay? I think so, yes. Yeah, okay, so the, another question, is there any question, uh, no, sorry, uh, is HERA the most significant project of your career? If not, what project it was? Most significant, well, well uh, one, one is Rosetta before, because it was a spectacular mission and I worked on it 15 years, for 15 years. Another, project where I worked on for some time, which I found really fascinating was Huygens, where I worked in the camera team of the, yeah, in the, uh, uh, so in the team that had the, the, in the cameras on the, on the lander on Titan, on Saturn's moon Titan. I also found this very fascinating to really get the first, the first images from, from this world. And it looked both, and the, the funny thing is, in certain respects, both uh, Titan and, uh, and Comet Churyumov looked, looked, looked quite Earth-like. 
Oh, interesting. Okay, uh, another question. I don't know how many time you have. The, no, we can. Have, minutes yeah, we can. Okay, okay. So, the what will Dart use as projectile, and what Sorry? shape does it? The question is the what will Dart use as projectile? I think whole Dart will be projectile probably. So. Uh, it says the whole Dart will. Yes, the whole Dart will be projectile. No, no, spe no special projectile there, yes. Is no, there's no, and the whole that, I mean, that is, a, is a that will carry a camera, so it will take images before it impacts, but the whole that mission will be the projectile. Yeah, okay. And it's 500 kilos or so and will impact with six kilometers per second. So, and uh, as you say, if I correctly remember, it will change uh, the orbital period of the moon by minutes, yes? Yes. Okay, so okay, so fine. Uh, the, okay, so this question is: Is there any quest? How many near Earth asteroids are discovered up to now? Um, I think it was in your presentation. 22, 000, about twenty-two thousand, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> here is uh, someone try to be funny. I think that, but okay, I will read it. <laughs> that, that it is true that satellites are able to fly to certain distance and then. They are blocked by something and cannot fly further. No. Uh, no, so. oh, he's just tried to be funny. No. No, I would say no too. Okay. No. <laughs> okay, and here is. I don't, I don't know what he means by blocking, but. Yeah, uh, how you block something which is uh, at this velocity? You just destroy them. It's just uh, what about Voyager? I'm uh, oh, they're all whole. Okay, well, whatever. Fine. So what was uh, you, ah? Now this is okay. This is also funny, but I, okay. What what was your feeling after seeing Armageddon on movie? <laughs> oh, it's a long time ago. <laughs> So it's you know so it's another it's like yes, impact it's, by nuclear nuclear the explosion yeah, just uh, it's, it's, just putting uh, two hole inside. Well, I don't, uh, I don't remember any strong feelings. I mean, it was it, it was fun from a scientific uh, point of view, not particularly accurate. But beyond those broad statements, I, I don't really remember anymore. Okay, and I will also read this guy, which don't want to say the, I mean, I will rephrase it. That the, 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 are we sure that Tunguska incident was meteorite? I think by now we are sure that it was an asteroid, yes. Then it was asteroid, yeah. Uh, but they didn't find the piece of it. Just they didn't really find uh, meteorites, but I think some... <clears throat> Some really microscopic material was found somewhere that hinted to an asteroid. Yeah, okay. So, and I have another question, probably last one that, uh, so when Misha, when, when uh, Hera mission will be successful and you will develop the successful strategy and the method will work, do you hope that uh, there will be some political decision to put money to uh, mission which will be ready and waiting for, for, uh, for uh, to be used uh, to deflect asteroid, or are you expecting situation when uh, we will just wait and then we will decide who will finance it? What is your estimation? Yes. What happened? I mean, there is a there is a roadmap for planetary defense, and the idea is currently after Hera to build some small asteroid exploration spacecraft that 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 kind of explore the characteristics of nearest asteroids that are relevant for impacts and then in a few decades from now have a predict kinetic impact with the idea to have another mission like that and Hera but then to be able to predict the um, the efficiency the, the momentum transfer shift efficiency of the impact this is one road and yes, there is some discussion to have a system in place to be able to react quicker if a deflection would be possible. I have now seen as an alternative, there is 
now so I will study the starting, if it is possible to <clears throat> convert a telecommunication satellite into an impactor spacecraft. Mm -hmm. So okay, instead of you. building something that is ready for launch, to have something that is already in space and to modify it to, to become the impactor spacecraft. So something like very cheap strategy to deflect. Astro. Yes. Yes. Ah, okay. Okay. So thank you very much. Let's thanks to our speaker. Thank you. Thank you for thanks the presentation. You. We appreciate it. And now we switch to our message for the people.